Are we alone in the universe? Does God exist? If so, what can be known about God? And can the life of Christ tell us anything about God and how to know him? Hey, stay tuned to this edition of Truth For New Generation because we're going to discuss these issues and more about God and our relationship with him on today's show. Hi, welcome to Truth For A New Generation. Alex McFarland here. The big question, does God exist? You know, 40 years ago, giving a speech at Cornell University, Carl Sagan said that modern science had eroded belief in God. And uh, he had that very famous miniseries in 1981, Cosmos. And uh, he basically, I would say, paved the way for much of the what was called the new atheism. Over the last decade, there have been many writers, some academic, most pop-level pundits who said that God doesn't exist, God is not necessary, and man has to find his meaning and his purpose and fulfillment in places other than religious belief. Now, when you ask 20-somethings through you know, mid to late 40-somethings in Western culture, why are you an atheist? Why are you an agnostic? I get this answer many times that science has disproven God. Well, in a few moments, we're going to have an interview with, with a true scholar, a true academic, Gary Habermas. We're going to talk about not only the rationality of believing in God, but specifically even Jesus. But let's talk about this for just a moment, because the world over, people believe in God. I've often quoted the late scholar Elton Trueblood. Elton Trueblood said, billions of people have claimed to have experienced God, some of the best and brightest in history. Brilliant people. And sure, uneducated people have been religious, but also the, the heights of academia. In fact, many of the founders of modern science, uh, unlike someone like Carl Sagan that was really more of a celebrity pundit or Bill Nye the science guy, I mean, the founders of modern science were inherently religious people. Now, Elton Trueblood said, look, of the millions and millions that have claimed to have experienced God, if even one of them was right, then God exists. And the likelihood that they were all delusional or misguided or malevolent, very unlikely. The greater likelihood is that God exists. Now, we're going to talk about in the show uh, what we can know about God in a number of ways through, I believe, the life and teachings of Jesus Christ. But back to Carl Sagan in a minute, because really over the last 30 years, his rejection of God really did pave the way for much of the pop-level atheism that would follow. Now, somebody asked Sagan one time about God, and he said, look, the, the physical laws of the universe, the God of, of Spinoza or Einstein, he said, if there is a God, it's gravity and physics and even matter itself. Let me give the quote. He said, quote, God is essentially the sum total of the physical laws which describe the universe. I can't imagine anyone denying the existence of the laws of nature, but I don't know of any compelling evidence for, quote, the old man in the sky, end of quote. Now, that caricature, which is really uh, a reductionistic fallacy to say, okay, God is nothing but some old man in the sky, a kindly old gentleman, a grandfatherly type with a long flowing white beard up in the sky. Look, that caricature, that's not what theists believe God is anyway, certainly not what Christians believe God is. In, in a way, believing that the physical world is God is really a form of pantheism. It's funny how atheism sort of digs a secret tunnel under to pantheism, and they don't worship anything but if they do, it's nature and the creation itself. Well, when we come back, we'll have a conversation with the world-renowned scholar on the resurrection, Gary R. Habermas, and then we'll conclude by looking at why, why it's rational to not only believe in God, but the personal God of the Bible. Stay tuned. Truth for a New Generation is back 
after this. I just returned from a conference at The Cove and it was absolutely breathtaking in every way. The mountain views, the tranquil areas within the woods and just being alone with God. Mornings spent watching the sunrise from a rocking chair with coffee in one hand and my Bible in the other. Evenings spent reflecting on the incredible spiritual teaching. It's the embodiment of peacefulness. Come and experience The Cove for yourself. Welcome back to Truth for a New Generation. I'm so excited for the guest that you're about to meet. Dr. Gary R. Habermas is known the world over as an expert on the resurrection of Christ. He's written extensively on historical evidence for Jesus, the authenticity of the New Testament. He's a dynamic apologist. He's been a speaker numerous times in our conferences. And at Liberty University, he is a distinguished research professor, and he is conversant on so many subjects. But I want to say that I know him not only as a scholar and a colleague, but as a friend. He was one of my main professors in graduate school and a reader on my thesis. And he has been for many years just a, a friend, an encourager, and a mentor. And I'm very glad for him to be our guest in this segment of the program. Dr. Habermas, welcome, and thanks for making time for this. Alex, you're very kind. I'm looking forward to it. Sounds like a great topic today. So, so let me throw this question out here. Um, are we alone in the universe? And if God exists, uh, why would we believe that? Well, you know, I, I think there's a lot of answers to that. And I usually answer on, on two levels. I would say there are good arguments for God's existence, and there are good arguments for an afterlife. Now, if you go back to, to the famous atheist uh, British atheist uh, uh, Russell, um, Bertrand Russell said, God and, a God and afterlife are the two standards you've got to believe in to be religious and to be an atheist. And he called himself an agnostic, but uh, to be an, a good atheist or agnostic, you need to deny God and an afterlife. So on one, on one hand, I would say we've got really good data for those two. A number of arguments for God um, of the arguments for the afterlife, I really like the argument from near-death experiences. But then if there's a God and an afterlife, then you have to ask what interpretation system, what worldview makes more sense of that data? Now, then I would say there's even more evidence for Christianity than there is for God and an afterlife. And there is immense evidence on both sides. So that combination to me tells me I'm in the right place uh, to be a Christian. What led you uh, to focus so extensively on the resurrection of Christ? Well, people ask me that, and they'll say, uh, let me guess, you wanted to help people with doubts, right? I'll say, well, I, I do talk to hundreds of people with doubts, but I wasn't so altruistic. I started on this subject because I was a very... I doubt it very deeply. In fact, uh, there's a story out there that I've told and it's gotten around that that I considered uh, Buddhism and uh, considered other religions, but Buddhism real seriously. And people might think, well, he was 15 years old or he just had a rebellious time. But this was after my PhD, after my PhD. So I thought, I mean, at least you can check other options. I'm not, I'm not blind to other kinds of data. And I've spent some serious time checking it. So resurrection for me was a subject that said, if this is true, it can hold the weight of Christianity in the sense that being raised from the dead would say a whole lot about the person who was raised because of all the incredible evidence for the resurrection. I remember back in 1981 when Carl Sagan had the famous NPR series Cosmos, and um, you know he he would say regarding religious claims or the claims of Christianity, extraordinary claims require or mandate extraordinary proof. When we're talking about the historicity of Jesus or even the resurrection, do the is he right? Are the skeptics right in saying that if if we claim God, miracles, Jesus, those are such extraordinary claims? That, that we've got to provide just extenuating levels of proof or, or they can't take it seriously. What's your response to that? 
I, I kind of go back and forth on this, Alex. It's really interesting because I do think a lot of my friends, my philosopher friends say, no, nah, that's just a prejudice. You, you, you start out with a, uh, an open worldview and you just go for it. But, you know, even as a Christian, if somebody tells me they saw this person who was healed or they had this incredible answer to prayer with evidence, I'll stop and I'll say, uh, excuse me for asking, but what kind of evidence are you talking about? So I, I do make that same kind of move, but I would say evidence for God and afterlife on the one hand, which basically only says all religions are shoulder to shoulder. When you say there's God in an afterlife, you can say uh, Buddhists, Hindus, uh, Muslims, Christians, we're standing there shoulder to shoulder, agreeing that naturalism, the world that the, the, nat, the view that the natural world is all there is, is incorrect. But now, once the everybody who's religious looks at each other and says, "Well, so here we are. We've got God in an afterlife." Then you have to start the ex, the hard work of where do the religious data lie. So, to me, there's two issues there, and uh, resurrection helped me work through those data that. that the data more than any other question did. And after, I mean, years, I actually walked away from the resurrection at one point thinking, you can believe it, but you can't show it's true. And it was only years later that I came to conclude that the resurrection happened with evidence. So it's been a long process, a long search for me. Uh, Two-part question. First, uh, what, what are the main reasons for accepting that Jesus physically rose from the dead? Well, I use what I call a minimal facts argument, and it, it works like this. I will use, to make my point in this argument, I will use only facts which have two characteristics. Number one, each, each fact, if you can picture a, a fact sitting here, and every fact is evidenced by a number of other facts that come in to say, yes, that's a fact. That's the most important evidence, good, good reasons to believe this fact. Then secondly, it's more like an accident of the good evidence. It's not as strong, but because of all that good evidence, skeptics in the field, now you gotta be in the field. You can't have a PhD in, in some other field. Um, just because I have a PhD, that doesn't make me an English expert or an astronomy expert. But if you have a PhD in a, re in a relevant field, New Testament, theology, religions, um, the ancient, ancient studies of any sort, uh, classics, you know what the data look like. And those folks who study that, it makes no difference if they're atheists, agnostics, or uh, skeptics of any sort, Christians or other religions, those who've studied the data report, like Bart Ehrman, the, the atheist, uh, University of North Carolina, Garrett Ludeman, the atheist from New Testament scholar from Germany, they will all grant these facts. So that's basically what I go with. Data that are so well established that everybody accepts them. And what can we say from those few pieces of data alone? I only use six of those, which I call minimal facts. I try to build a case on the data that, that back up those facts. Okay. And, and what are those facts? Well, if I had to say them real quickly, Jesus died due to crucifixion. I'm working with a couple of guys right now in an argument, article for a medical journal that summarizes where medical doctors are on this topic, those who have actually investigated crucifixion. Secondly, the disciples had experiences that they believed were appearances of the resurrection. That's all I need. They thought they saw the risen Jesus. Three, these were proclaimed very, very early. And this is probably the biggest area of change. Atheist New Testament scholars will allow that, as Garrett Ludeman says, that that material was preached and taught immediately after it occurred. Whatever the experience is, and he doesn't believe in the resurrection, but whatever the experience was, they began preaching it immediately. So it was very soon. Uh, fourthly, their lives were transformed to the point of being willing to die. Now, many people are being are willing to die, but virtually everybody is willing to die for a theme, for a, a, a message. The disciples were the only ones in history who were willing to die because they thought they saw an actual resurrection. And then two skeptics, Paul and James, both unbelievers, James, the brother of Jesus, both unbelievers before, 
both believers after because they think they also saw the risen Jesus. Now, I often throw the empty tomb in here. I don't call that a minimal fact. That's for another reason. But there's over 20 critical reasons to believe in empty tomb. You throw all of that together, and there are some really strong considerations here, and even skeptics will tell you that. If Jesus rose, then uh, what may we conclude from that? Well, I can't I can't think of a better example. A mathematician's been writing to me just the last couple of days and says, let's put this into a mathematical formula. And we've been working on this, but here's the question. If Jesus was raised from the dead, and if there are no other evidenced resurrections of major religious founders, that makes him look like, all right, well, what do you want to tell us? What? And he, he predicted it ahead of time. By the way, that's admitted by almost all skeptics now, or, or at least the majority. He, he, to predict it means you've got to know something about the world and something about the plan or you wouldn't know something was coming this big. So he's part of this plan. He said, he said over and over, his miracles are a sign. That's what miracles mean. They're a sign that what he taught was true and that he was going to rise from the dead. And then he did it. To me, that says a lot of things because he claimed to be deity. So I've got to look seriously at claims to be the son of God. Uh, if the resurrection happened, there's an afterlife. So that happened, that helps us with the near-death experience. It's very similar, only this is a specific case. I think the main thing is if if dead men don't do much. So if he's if he's dead, dead as a doornail, somebody had to act on him if a resurrection occurred. He said it was his father. He said his father was uh, approving his teachings. And I wouldn't just go willy-nilly and say everything he said in the universe is true, like there's sparrows out in that tree outside. I would say that only the most central things are known to be true. And his central teaching is he claimed to be deity, and he said, here's a kingdom, there's a kingdom coming, and I'm the path to the kingdom. Rudolf Boltmann, the, the famous German skeptic, said, Jesus said, in me, you're confronted with the facts that will get you into the door of the kingdom. It's the key. Jesus' teachings, Jesus himself is the key to the kingdom. That was his number one teaching. It's allowed by virtually everybody. The kingdom of God and how to get there was his central teaching. And I've got to say, wow, if he was raised the dead, I better listen to his exhortation there. You're working on a major work. You and I discussed this the other day of, of ancient evidence for the life of Christ, the, the naturalistic rejections of the resurrection refuted, and then positive arguments for the resurrection like you're, you're giving right now. Uh, how, how large and how extensive are, are these positive, positive uh, pages of research in favor of Christ? Well, right now, it's got to be edited, so the number's going to change, and it's going to go up, not down, because I have a tendency, tendency to be a little verbose. But right now, it is at 5,200 pages for the, for the life, just the bare fact that Jesus existed, but chiefly for the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, 5,200 pages. You know, earlier this week, I was talking with Jay Warner Wallace, Cold Case Christianity, and, and we've, uh, you and I have interacted and worked together for years, and I, I think about the late Norm Geisler and Lee Strobel. I, I mean, a lot of these guys, like yourself, that are living Christianity, defending Christianity, I mean, th these guys are not dummies. These are scholars whose, whose life and trade is seeking through evidence and finding facts. You know, I, I guess, let me say this with, we've only got a little bit of time left. So often I, I dialogue with people that have maybe read a blog site and they're like, uh, I walk away from God, I'm an atheist. But the guys that are the, the educated professional scholars are, are already Christian or are coming to Christ. Uh, is it fair to say there's this great big disconnect between street-level atheism versus the academic world that is really coming to accept what the New Testament says? I mean, yeah, I, I would, on that one, I would cite Bart Ehrman, who's probably the best-known New Testament skeptic in the world, an atheist. And he, I don't want to say makes fun of, but he goes off for many pages, 20 pages, 25 pages. He goes off on people who say Jesus never lived because he says, look, he said, I'm going to be honest with you. He said, there, there's nobody among you that I know of who has credentials. He said, except two of you, and every, anybody in the field knows who the two are. But he said, even those two don't have a university position. 
So he said, my point is, Bart Ehrman speaking, he said, there are no accredited scholars that he knows of among the thousands who teach in this area, no accredited scholars who teach in, a, in a, an accredited college, university, or seminary who believes Jesus doesn't exist. And you start with data. Now, for example, he gives 15 independent sources all early for the crucifixion of Jesus. And then he says, he goes, now what? Are you going to tell me I accept these because there's good Bible verses? He said, well, first of all, I'm using a number of texts that are not in the New Testament. But secondly, he says, no, I don't accept this stuff because it's the New Testament. I don't accept the New Testament. But when I use verses from the New Testament, he says, I only use accredited verses. And that's that minimal concept. He only uses data that can be backed up. So I think, I think it's a good way to do research. Bottom line, it's credible to accept what the New Testament says about Christ. Hey, we got to pull away. We've got to resume this conversation again at a very early time. Habermas, Dr. Habermas, I want to say thanks for your time. I wish you and your family a great new year, and let's visit again soon. Sounds good, Alex. I look forward to it. God bless you. Thank you. Hey, stay tuned, folks. Truth for New Generation is back right after this. My beliefs aren't exactly popular. You can tell me I'm on the wrong side of history all you want, but you won't change my mind. That's because I'm standing on something that doesn't change. Therefore, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. As Christians, it's important to remember that no matter how good or bad things may seem, nothing changes our king or our call. So, is there a God? That's life's biggest question, really. Does God exist? What kind of God exists? And how may I know this God who exists? Hi, Alex McFarlane here. Welcome back. You know, in interviews, one-on-one -on -one interviews with 32 prominent atheists, I was struck by how many of the atheists, really 30 of the 32, were religious, even Christian, and through some painful circumstance decided to abandon God, or maybe they felt like Christians were hypocrites or unintelligent, but really more for emotional reasons rather than intellectual reasons. They decided to take a, a stance for unbelief and really against God. It's amazing two things in interviewing atheists and skeptics and those struggling with doubt. And, and let me be very clear. It's okay to wrestle with questions. I wrestle with questions. I'm not saying it's wrong to question, but look, when you find answers and evidence and a conclusion, I really do believe, and certainly scripture concurs, that we have an obligation to act and respond and to believe and follow God once we find truth. Uh, I've had atheists ask me to pray for sick relatives an atheist asking a pastor to pray, which I'm happy to do. Uh, the posture of many atheists is almost like, there is no God, and I'm mad at him, and he's evil. <laughs> so uh, many of the atheists that I know talk more about God than, than ministers. But back to the question in all seriousness, I, I think Habermas is right. There's great evidence to believe in the trustworthiness of the Bible, the trustworthiness of what the the New Testament says about Jesus, and if Jesus rose, and even critical scholars, uh, you may not have known these names like Bart Ehrman or Gerd Ludeman, but look, there are critical scholars, and by that I mean act, true academics that are skeptics themselves, who say, look, Jesus existed, and probably the best explanation is that he rose from the grave. The naturalistic attempts to explain it away, stolen body, hallucinations, ghost, alien, none of those work. There's an empty tomb, Christ rose. What does that tell us? Well, if Jesus rose, then God exists because the only man that ever rose from the dead taught about a theistic universe. Now, none of us can surpass the resume of Jesus. Jesus's credentials eclipse all of us. Virgin born, sinless life, miraculous deeds, taught the scriptures, rose from the dead. And until the critic, the skeptic, can surpass 
the pedigree of the only man that ever rose from the grave, let's take Christ's assessment of life. And he says, look, God exists, he loves us, but we have a sin problem. And he rose from the dead saying that we need to come to him and have our sins forgiven. And add to that modern evidences like the complexity of DNA and near-death experiences that strongly argues for the supernatural, the afterlife, this cumulative case, powerful. You know, there was a second century leader, Tatian, who said, out of a world of Mithras and Dionysus and Horus and Osiris, it was a relief, said Tatian, to change the tyranny of 10,000 gods for the monarchy of one. Augustine said this, that the child of the manger fills the world. And not only that, this risen Jesus who loves you, he can fill your heart as well. God is real and he loves you. What is truth? What is truth? Shabam, there it is, the big kahuna, the spicy enchilada, the fizzy lifting drink. The claim God exists is not a subjective claim. This is not an evidence problem. So like, truth is basically subjective. Yeah, yeah emotional. This is Debunk TV. You know, we believe by faith, trust, but I think it is so exciting that our faith is validated, underscored by compelling lines of evidence. Hey, let me encourage you to learn and grow. Let me recommend my book, The Assault on America. I would ask you to buy this book. It's available online at Amazon, the Christian websites, Barnes and Noble, the bookstores. This book, What is Wrong with Our Nation?, where we were as a country, how we were founded, and how you can make a difference for the spiritual and moral awakening and political renaissance our country so desperately needs. I encourage you to read my book, The Assault on America. But let me talk to you for a moment about supporting this ministry, and let's proclaim truth to America and beyond. Uh, if you would consider supporting this ministry for a gift of at least $50, a tax-deductible donation. We're talking about defending God and truth. I want to send you two books for your gift of $50 or more. My book, 10 Answers for Skeptics. This is part of my one-on-one -on -one interviews with atheists around the world. We answer more than 70 questions of atheists in this book. 10 answers, 10 types of skeptics. Then I'll include also my book, The God You Thought You Knew, exposing 10 common myths about Christianity based on one-on-one -on -one interviews with some 300 college students and 20-somethings. If you make your gift at least $75, in addition to these two books, I will throw in the great apologetics t-shirt, Better Living Through Apologetics. Very quirky, cool, retro, the truth for a new generation t-shirt. All of this for your gift of at least $75 for truth for a new generation. Thanks for watching. Let us hear from you. You can give online or through the mail, but know that we appreciate your interest and your support.